In the history of the Tour de France, it has been the mountains that make the man. Or is it the man that makes the mountains mythical? It's the Pyrenees today, the final big stage of climbing. They've got some of the most famous climbs in the history of the sport before they descend down to the finish line in a big battle for yellow. The last big day in the mountains, starting in Lourdes, finishing in Laurence, it is 200.5 kilometres and some enormous climbs amongst the most famous in the history of the sport. The Col d'Espan, the Col de Tourmalet and the Col d'Obis. But that's not all that's on the agenda. There's plenty more along the way. This is a tough day's racing. Before, that's Roman Hardy calling for some more water to support this man at the front, his teammate Warren Barguil. Tanel Kanget of Astana has been very patient within that group so far. He's just waiting. Super active on that dramatic short 65 kilometre stage on stage 17. Caught near the top of the climb by Nato Quintana. Quite obviously not able to hold on to the Colombian who went on to win solo. But Kanget, very wise in the breakaway today. Just enough to keep everybody else happy, but not wasting any energy. Lillian Kalmajan is at the back of the race because he is struggling. Lillian Kalmajan does not look good. This is Maciej Bodnar with the jersey fully unzipped for Bora Hansgrohe and the mouth wide open of Peter Sagan. Real concerns for the prospects of Peter Sagan making it through to the end of today's stage or making it through at least with inside the time cutoff. These are not motions by Peter Sagan playing up for the camera. Peter Sagan playing up for the camera is bunny hops up on a footpaths, wheelies to try and wave to the crowd one-handed wheelies. This is Peter Sagan really in a world of hurt. As well as the physical pain, I think there's so much mental anguish. Peter Sagan would just like to get off the bike and stop the pain. Well, he's nearly three minutes already behind the yellow jersey group. The time delay today will be somewhere in the vicinity of 45 minutes, I would imagine. So he can still come in a long way behind, but this is just the start. This is just the start of the tough climbing. Well, on the road, the gap is around 500 metres. It's been a little bit more than that if he's three minutes behind the bunch. We're heading out towards 750 metres to a kilometre behind the peloton now. And the chances of catching the Gruppetto are also pretty slim for him. Still a long way to climb. This is Yates now at the back of the group, still all bandaged up from that horrible fall when he could almost taste a stage victory. The man that won that day, Julien Alaphilippe, is in this group wearing the polka dot jersey. This is his teammate and his roommate, Bob Youngles, at the front. The Luxembourg national champion is the best placed overall in this group. 13th position at 14 minutes and 20 seconds down. He was hoping for a top 10 finish in the race overall. He's a long way off that. He's at 4 minutes and 50 seconds behind 10th place, which is Jakob Fulsong. Now his objective is to join his roommate and collect a stage win. If he was to do so, that would make it number 5 for quick step. Still Katusha with Pavel Kotchikov leading the chase for Katusha. This is the move by Marc Soler. Up to speeds of 24 kilometers an hour. Meanwhile, the yellow jersey, Garant Thomas just at 20 k's per hour. Marc Soler still off the front of the peloton. He's making a little bit of ground. We haven't quite got a check on him just as yet as to how far in front he is. All riders being distanced at the back of the peloton. Lawson Craddock here, number 13. Just hanging on the back of the big group. On the right in the Belgian champion jersey is Yves Lampart. And Peter Sagan, he is twisted like a pretzel. You can see him just adjusting himself, trying to straighten himself up. Those knees going everywhere for Sagan. Normally looks just so comfortable. Huge problems for the green jersey. And I still think 
quite a danger of him stepping off if he's suffering this badly on the Aspan, the first proper climb of the day. And there's so much more to come. The next climb is the Tourmalade. The pain may become unbearable because it's not just the, the injuries you have, it's what they do to the rest of your body. I can imagine his knees are really starting to hurt as well. You put so much pressure in the wrong places. Now he's at more than two minutes behind the yellow jersey group of Garant Thomas. Meanwhile, out in front, that group containing Julian Alaphilippe and Bob Youngles, they're extending their lead on the yellow jersey group because the Katusha team, they just don't have the horsepower to do the chasing. It's still Kotchikov who was at the front for Katusha. They're spending a lot of energy, well, one rider at least from Katusha, spending a lot of energy without really any impact at all on that leading group. It was a group of 18 at one point. It's now down to 12 out in front, as this is Maciej Bodnar, the winner of stage 20 last year, the individual time trial in Marseille, trying to time trial Peter Sagan through to the finish line. Can you hear it ticking? It's the grinding of the gears. Well, 10% of that is about 33 and a half minutes. Another one fifth of that is going to be six and a half minutes. So we're looking at 40 minutes. This That's is, not a lot. It's not a lot of time with so much climbing to come. Almost at the top of the cold ass spam. It is Julien Alaphilippe collecting the points category one climb 10 points at the top of this one once he goes across the top Julian Alaphilippe has the king of the mountains classification secured no reaction coming from the others in the group his nearest rival Warren Barguil is not concerned 10 points at the top of the Aspan for Julian Alaphilippe if he just makes it to Paris he will be the winner of the king of the mountains classification Bargill does come through in second place of the group, so just assuring himself of that runner-up position in the King of the Mountains competition and the associated prize money for his team. The rest of the group come over the top. Benati Abidon for Amador. That's what's left of this group. 12 men started the climb with 18. Riders like Godin, also Sylvain Chavanel, been dropped. Arthur Vichaud, also distanced. Peter Sagan is just over two and a half minutes behind the peloton at the moment. But he's six and a half minutes behind the front of the race. And now Katusha putting an extra rider onto the front. I can only assume that when we get down there, it will be Ian Boswell who's moved up towards the front for Katusha. Well, Matt, if Peter Sagan gets through this stage, survives within the time limit, that'll be his biggest and bravest performance of this tour it will Katusha not the only ones at the front of the peloton now this is Sunweb Nikki is aunt and also coming towards the front Lotto and El Jumbo so not letting things just all play into the hands of Team Sky they're at least trying to put some pressure on it's like he had the other day I'd imagine he's a little bit sheepish about going too quick downhill and taking big risks this is Amador at the front of the race. The two riders from Movistar are in this group. Now the back of the group with the yellow number on. That is Daniela Bonatti. There's plenty of cars still in front of him, but there has been no Gruppetto form. Race Radio confirming that the main peloton is all pretty much still together. This is a group that's just been slightly dropped at the rear. Lawson Craddock with the pink colours on from Education First. This is Yves Lampart, the Belgian national champion. Affectionately known as John Deere for his farming family heritage. The man on the tractor. And he's as strong as a tractor. Big Diesel. Just keeps on going, ploughing away. 
This is Kolchikov, followed by Niels Pollitt, and then Ilmar Zakarin, the three leaders from Katusha at the front of the peloton. But their deficit now is back out over four minutes. At the base of the climb, they had it down to just over three minutes. They've conceded a fair bit of ground up the Colbass span. A lot of energy spent by the team, and they don't have too many resources. They're down to just four riders, that team. Good to see the team, though, still showing plenty of fight. Across the top at 4 minutes and 11 seconds behind the breakaway group. Breakaway group now down to 11 riders. Peter Sagan looked twisted and bent early on the stage. It's getting worse. Gives us even more context to his eighth place finish yesterday. See how much he's hanging over the side of the saddle. There's no way that he's getting power out of both legs. He'd be riding with one leg effectively, the other one just not activating with the way his body is. From the breakaway group, it's then four minutes and 10 seconds to the peloton. It is about six and a half minutes to a group that includes Arno Demar and John Degenkoll. And then seven and a half minutes is the gap from the front of the race to the Peter Sagan group. So he's only one minute behind a group that contains a few of the other sprinters. If he can rejoin them on the descents, unfortunately it's then straight onto the Tourmalade, not much of a valley road at all, but it still gives him a fighting chance to make it through to the finish inside the time cutoff. We saw on the left-hand side of the screen, bottom left-hand side of the screen, confirmation of the points at the top of the climb. And it was Julian Alaphilippe extending his lead in the race for the King of the Mountains classification. He is now out to a lead of 70 points. With less than 70 points remaining available on the stage. In fact, there's just 65 points still available if you win over the top of all of the remaining climbs on today's stage. This is Gorka Izaguirre, the Spanish national champion for Bahrain Merida. Ala Philippe on the way down, understandably so, with a man with such skills, such bike handling skills, making every post a winner. Driving their advantage home. Bob Youngle's just behind him. He said before the stage, Julian Ala Philippe, his priority, the King of the Mountains jersey. Now it looks like he is prepared to make a few sacrifices for his very close friend and teammate, Bob Youngles. This is Roman Hardy, number 44 from Fortuneo Sam Singh. He's been the quietest of the riders from that team. This is the only, the third breakaway that he's been in. Quiet is all relative to how active the rest of the team has been. Warren Bargill, you've said it a few times already, he's been in too many breakaways. Hasn't quite picked his mark and conserved his energy. Today, he gets another chance, though. He has cast a very wide net in this tour, getting amongst everything possible, but not able to round it off. We've seen him a few times just have to pass as they start to race for the win, and he gets dropped. And it's just an accumulation of fatigue. Throughout the Tour de France, it's like you've got... Look at it this way, two gas tanks. You got one for your overall throughout the whole tour and that, that just gradually runs down. Well, you got your daily one, which runs out on the day, top back up overnight, but it runs out more quickly every day. That stage tank. And as you make that one run out quicker each day and you're, you're really getting in the brakes and using a lot of that gas, your overall one also starts to drop quicker. And you just can't back up. Peter Sagan, almost at the top of the cold ass span. He's four minutes behind the yellow jersey group of Garrett Thomas. Two crucial teammates with him. That's Maciej Bodnar who leads over the top. For quick step, it's Max Ricchesi. Daniel Oss is at the rear of the group. How many risks will he take on the way down? Normally he takes plenty and that's what cost him two days ago. The big risk that he did take, paid a heavy price. Too fast, not enough break. The exact words of Peter Sagan. Even the best make mistakes. 
and you make a small mistake in a downhill like that, all those other consequences that you see with Peter Sagan now covered in bandages, in extreme pain on the bike, just fighting to survive when he's been the man dominating at the front of the race, looking so comfortable in the climbs, going on the attack on Category 4 climbs, not getting dropped on them. Now a front group of 12 on the descent from the Col d'Aspin. And they'll just about be able to see from parts of this descent the flanks of the Tourmalade. Buffering at the back of the race, you can see the gap now. Peter Sagan, four minutes behind the yellow jersey group. Four minutes and 19 seconds in front of the yellow jersey group is this combination. A strong, strong group of 12. That was Roman Hardy charging through. He wants to give this chance for the breakaway to win, to get the victory for Warren Bargill. The two riders from Mitchelton Scott, Mikhail Nievi at the rear of the group. Bandaged up is Adam Yates. Also in that group, Bob Youngles, who's the best placed overall from Quick Step, along with Julian Alaflit. Tenel Kanga from the Astana team. Bolka Mollema, haven't seen too much of Bolka Mollema, but he's in there. He's been doing the pacemaking, but not wasting energy. Gorka Izagira is also amongst them. Tom Yelta Schlachter is still holding on. So too is Daniela Bonatti. Quite a gradual descent, this one, off the Aspen. From the top of the Aspen to the start of the Tourmalet is around 12 kilometers. A real pedaling descent. You can see Niels Pollitt on the front. Time trial position. Forearms resting on the handlebars. Riding around 65 kilometres an hour. The official website for the Tour de France, they've just been on the phone to Paxi Villa, one of the sports directors for Bora Hansgrohe, who has said that Peter is having the toughest day of his cycling life, but he wants to make it across to the Gruppetto. Sounds like Peter Sagan's prepared to take a few risks on the descent. And there it is, the or category Col de Tourmalet, 17 kilometres to the top. These first slopes when they turn on, fairly gentle to begin with, right up alongside this rock wall for just over a kilometre. And then you do a, a right-hand turn onto the real foot of the climb where it kicks up properly. So this is still a place where, as a group, you can work together, swapping turns of pace before the real climbing starts. This is the 82nd time on the Col de Tourmalet, first used in 1910. A leading group of 12 riders holding on to an advantage of just over 4 minutes and 10 seconds on the peloton. The yellow jersey on the shoulders of Garant Thomas, so far, looks comfortable. He hasn't been threatened. In this breakaway, the leader of the King of the Mountains classification, Julien Alaphilippe. He's entertained us for three weeks. He has had an incredible tour and one that has been well earned and well deserved and much appreciated by everybody following the race. Spectacular. That is the word that defines him in this Tour de France, Julien Alaphilippe. Love the way he's ridden. And we heard those comments about how he has matured. He's a little, a little less impulsive than he used to be. But evidence of that was some of the days that he got in the break and he took the major points on the first climb, or maybe two, and then sat himself up realising, if I go on with this, I will completely run onto empty and I won't be able to back it up in a couple of days' time. So he gave himself time to recover and resist the urge to keep going further up the road. Another Eglise Notre Dame de Assumption. We had a lot of those yesterday throughout the stage. Countless, in fact. This one goes back to the 17th century. And the small town that they're going through now was made famous in the Tour de France when Eugene Christophe stopped through here at a blacksmith to be able to repair the forks on his bike. And Eugene Christophe, who also well known as the first rider to ever wear the Maillot Jaune in the Tour de France. This is Lillian Kalmajan at the rear end of the peloton. Here's the Col de Tourmalet. You know the climb well. I know the climb well. Easy at first, those lower slopes. The 
gradient up the valley very gentle for the first couple of kilometers once the climb really starts and that's what i'm talking about at 7.7 .7, where that graphic turns red and then black up the flanks all of it is really tough and it kicks hard out of la mangie and also these little sections at the top you see that one black section really really tough and by the time you're up that high you're at 2,000 meters above sea level the air is thin from the breakaway Sylvain Chavanel he's no longer in the breakaway he was trying desperately to turn the clock back in the 2003 edition of the Tour de France it was Sylvain Chavanel who led over the top years ago heading to the Col de Tourmalet he's in the breakaway well he was he's been dropped from the breakaway but still fighting so there's three going off the front it was Ian Boswell he's in, and then Mikael Lander Roman Bardet in eighth after that last mountain stage at five minutes 13 he's wary of everybody behind him within about six minutes going off his time trial on the penultimate stage last year but there's no point is there really Bardet trying to ride to defend eighth he has to ride to try and win the stage Boswell in his first Tour de France after the earlier part of his career spent with the Sky team, he's now racing to support Zacharin to win the stage. Lander looks good in third spot. He's seventh overall at 4 minutes 34. He's already ahead of Bardet, but that may be why the reaction is coming. Bardet is hoping on this stage he could have got back in front of Lander. As Bardet, of course, dropping from fifth to eighth. The team car now alongside the breakaway. Are they telling him to stay? That's, yeah, they are telling him to stay in this group. That was Jose Vicente Garcia, the cost of the sports director from Movistar. Just stay here, Andre. We've got a little job for you later on. Help Mikael Lander or Mato Quintana. Yates at the front, followed by Youngles. Then Kangert. Alaphilippe is next. Bolka Molima. Mikael Nievi in this group. So to Tom Yelta Schlachter. Good news for Peter Sagan fans. Sagan has caught a group with Arnaud Demar and Alexander Kristoff. So he's in some sort of a gruppetto. But that's not the battle won. The battle is against himself and against the pain, the agony that he's in to just get through this stage. Survive now. Pure survival. The peloton is by Tom Yalta Slachter, consistent with expectations. A man for the smaller hills, not for the big mountains, but good on him getting into the break. This, though, is not expected. This is Balka Molima who is being distanced. Maybe not completely expected, but I'm also not shocked. Balka Molima has used so much energy over the last few days getting into breakaways. He's been amongst everything in the mountain stages. So he's been burning the candle at both ends, the Dutchman. Bardet now attacks. This is the move that Bardet needed to make, and he has made it. Not racing to defend a position, racing to take positions and to take a stage victory. Great move, a brave move. It's one he has to make, he has to try. Gambler losing everything that he's got at the moment, which is not much. Dillier is waiting for him. He's got a handful of ice. He'll offer this to Roman Bardet, but first he'll offer a wheel to bridge across to these two. Boswell is no longer here. Mikael Lander with the throttle open. Zacharin just behind him. Ice for Bardet. No, uh, don't want it. Ditch that. Let's get on. And Very look at what is left. Group. Team Sky now riding. So up until this point, they've been content to let everybody else do the chasing. Katusha on the front. Let AG2R mark the move of Lander. Now Bardet is gone. It's time to take over with what they've got. Jakob still Fulsang. have five in a row. Jakob Fulsang from Astana. Tenth in the overall standings. Rafael Micah responding. Jonathan Castroviejo at the front for Sky. Patiently watching. And at the moment, they're just going to leave Castroviejo to set the pace. Michal Kwiatkowski is the man in second wheel for Team Sky in front of yellow jersey. Geraint Thomas. With still 100 kilometres to race, Geraint Thomas, for now at least, he only really needs to respond to Tom Dumoulin or Primez Roglic. At the moment. Dan Martin, number 91. His feet will be getting itchy.
We see it so often from Team Sky. They don't react immediately to the attacks. They don't make the big accelerations. Just stay at that wattage output that that particular rider can handle. When they consider this gap's getting too big for Castroviejo to keep a lid on, that's when they let Kwiatkowski pick the pace up a little bit. Try and narrow it down. He'll lead them all the way down the descent off the Tourmalade through the valley to the foot of the Cat 2, Col de Bourdier. Really good job being done by Sylvain Dillier from AG to Al Le Mondial. He has been in the breakaway most of the day. Drop from the break, now setting the tempo for that group that includes his team leader, Roman Bardet. Here's the attack of Bardet. 21, 22 kilometres an hour as he jumps away. Don't forget, this is a section of around 9% gradient. That sort of wattage on the flat would have you going over 50 kilometres an hour. Sylvain Dillier. He's done all that he can do. Now these three are working together. This is an alliance. This is Mikael Landa, Roman Bardet, and then Ilna Zakarin. In the overall standings, Landa is seventh, 434 behind the yellow jersey. Bardet is eighth at 513. Zakarin is in 12th position at 1131. Zakarin, Bardet, and Landa, they'd love to move up overall, but more than that, a stage win. That would top off their tour. And with what you just read out about those riders and where they are on GC, that's why 10th position, Jakob Fulsang, nine and a half minutes behind, he's had to go and try and bridge across. That's him in the background, the blurry figure trying to come across. The colours of Astana. This is Marcus Burkhardt from Bora Hansgrohe. With the Astana rider, Jakob Fulsang, is Marcus Burkhardt's teammate, Rafael Maika. I wonder if he'll drop off the lander group and just do a few hundred metres for Rafael Micah. If he can. I think he That's can. The way he's climbing. If he can, I'm expecting him to be pretty quickly dropped off this group with the pace they're setting on the lower slopes of the Tourmalade. That was full sang, along with Micah, just through the pitcher. Now it is Castro Viejo. Followed by Walt Poles. Then it's Geraint Thomas. Next in line is Froome having a drink. Followed by number two, Egan Bernal. Tom Dumoulin. The two riders from Mitchelton Scott, really the two driving forces from this leading group. Each time we've returned to the front of the race, it's been either Adam Yates, as it is now, or Mikael Nievi setting the tempo. They have been setting the tempo the whole time. The question is, is it too much? Are they doing too much in this group? and risking their chance of being able to win the stage. They do have a tailwind through this section of the climb up the Tourmalet, so the wind blowing up the valley for them. Well, Poles just sweeping around the outside for Team Sky, returning to the front. Just a few moments ago, we could hear from Race Radio that Poles was at the back of the yellow jersey group and struggling. Five kilometers to the top for this group of four. Mikael Lander is the man who is setting the tempo. They are one minute in front of the yellow jersey group. Lander at the front, Raphael Micah in second spot. Third place is Roman Bardet. And at the back is the Russian answer in style to Chris Froome, Ilna Zakarin. They look really similar on the bike. He'd like a CV half as good as Chris Froome's, but they do look similar. Bardet, Lander. Does he have any sweat glands? He's the only one in this group not dripping with sweat. Well, he's a pretty cool customer, Mikel Lunda, but he must be sweating. He's wiping it from the brow, but he looks comfortable. Roman Bardet through to the front on the charge, hoping to take back some of that time he lost two days ago. Mountaintop finish, won by Naro Quintana. And the front group will be entering La Mangie, which brings them around four and a half kilometers from the top of the climb. Mikael Lander, one minute in front of the yellow jersey group, which is being led by Team Sky, his former teammates. And he was reported as saying that throughout his time at Team Sky, the thing that he didn't quite enjoy was the training. The training, so much discipline, he loves the racing. And now he's racing and he's riding away. He's putting Zacharin into the box. He's really starting to struggle. So too Bardet. It's only Raphael Micah who was able to respond, but he's not there yet. Bardet is having a tough, tough tour. That is an impressive acceleration from Mikael Lunder. 
we said how comfortable he was looking and was he even sweating he was perspiring a little but he was looking so good and now the acceleration as he rides through la mangi four kilometers to the summit for the breakaway it's about four and a half kilometers from this point in the town of la mangi back of the group so will be julian alaphilippe who will lead them through Alain Philippe at the front as they go across the top of the Col de Tourmalet. It's the souvenir Jacques Gaudet for Alain Philippe. The winner of the King of the Mountains classification provided he stays on his bike and makes it to Paris. They now start descending. And careful on this descent. Remember Jens Vogt a few years ago off the top. Hands just loose on the handlebars and there was that invisible bump. Hands off the bars, over the top, straight on his face. He doesn't remember anything of it. It's a tricky descent. It's quite rough at the top, bumpy road. So full concentration required on the way down. Rafael Marker cresting the top of the climb, just a handful of seconds behind. And look at that, that bit and loaded up with gels on it. It looked like a little Christmas tree. It did time to eat time to drink and just that little bit further forward it lets him go over there compose before the rest of the group catch up to him bar day can seriously descend you don't get much time to compose look how quickly it drops away and you've got some really tight turns right at the top of this descent down there first big hairpin Yates at the back of the group surely he's still a little bit rattled from that crash to Banier de Luchon very very steep here at the top and that dirt on the inside yep. of the corner right on the apex dirty and dusty so you've got to have your wits about you on this descent further down it is extremely fast you get some really long sections still bumpy and rough but you'll be up above 90 kilometers an hour it's quite a frightening descent to ride well poles on the front the white jersey Pierre Latour that is as comfortable as he has looked on any of the mountains throughout this year's race. The peloton, they crest the top. Two minutes and 54 seconds. So Mikael Lander now more than two minutes in front of that yellow jersey group. He is improving his position in the overall standings for now. Where it really matters though, obviously the only time it actually matters is at the finish line. But we saw on that stage at Alpe d'Huez with Stephen Kruisweig, who was making huge gains in the overall standings. But he spent so much energy in the process and was reeled back in on the final climb. Yates just giving them a little bit of distance. Well, Poles leading the charge for Sky. They will lose time on the descent. Team Sky will not take a single risk. Alaphilippe will lead them all the way down this descent and Bob Youngles just benefiting from following the lines of his teammate and roommate and best mate. Good man to follow. Gradient easing off just through this section. You see the descent stretching away in the distance. This is the Chase Peloton led by Team Sky. They'll be very pleased with the weather. The forecast at the back end of the day was 60 to 70 percent chance of rain. It's bright and sunny here at the finish line. That's good news for Garant Thomas. Luxembourg flag on the side of the road. They'll be very pleased to see their national champion Bob Youngles at the front of the race. Yates is sticking with them. He's giving a little bit of ground heading into the corners sprinting spend a bit more energy on the straight sections but he's not being dropped he's not being left behind there really isn't any margin for error on this descent of the colder tourmalade this is the front of the race and of course it is julian alaphilippe followed by bob youngles warren bargill mikhail nevi tenel kangert and at the back gorka is a Bahrain Marita so far in this year's race they've had four second place finishes one apiece for the Izaguirre brothers and two second place finishes for Sonny Colbrelli both of those behind Peter Sagan 
Speaking of, Peter Sagan, 11 minutes behind the front of the race, some eight minutes behind the Sky-led peloton. In a group of 19. And Good he'll, news. He'll make it. He will make it, I think. Can I put that caveat on it? Yes. I hope. Still got another big climb to come. To the top of the Obisque via the Bourdier and the Solour. After the Cat 2 of the Col de Bourdier, they get three kilometres downhill before they're on the slopes of the Col de Solour, which is uncategorised because it really just forms the flank of the Col de Bisque. This little downhill often. This is the second group on the road. And it is Andre Amador who is at the front. Yates in the tuck position, slowly losing ground. He needs to be on the wheel on those straight sections. Amador is a very good descender. A man who doesn't mind taking the big risks on the downhills. So a good man to lead the group down for Mikael Lunda. It's really windy. Look at the flags on the side of the road. How much of an impact does that have on your ability to hit the apex and get the cornering right? It can blow you around a little bit, get you just very slightly offline, but you've just got to give yourself that little margin for error, especially if you're in this group leading it for Geraint Thomas and Chris Froome. Doesn't need to be full gas down here. We've got the front of the race at three minutes. They've got that group in between two and a half minutes in front of them, but at the moment, still safe enough for Team Sky. No risk riding. A little bit of gas off because it is things like that. That blustery wind that gets you offline, make a mistake and blow it. No need to aim for the lines, aim just inside the lines. I'm impressed to see David Godot still in this group. The young Frenchman, so too Egan Bernal. This is Castro Viejo, followed then by Kwiatkowski. The two best descenders for Sky and two of the coolest heads under this situation. Also just sitting there enjoying the free ride. The men from Lotto NL Yumbo with Steven Kroosvak and Primoz Roglic. So news today. Good news for Robert Hiesink, who's ridden a really good tour in service of those men and in service of Dylan Grunewig on the flat stages. He's just re-signed with Lotto NL Yumbo for a further three years. He's never ridden with another team. He went through their development system. He's been with that team. I think when you include his time in their under-23 squad, for 13 years? I think Maybe even more. more. 14 or 15 when you include the under 23 years. Been a long time. Loyal service and it works both ways. Just at the back of the yellow jersey group, that was Jon Izagira. The brother of Gorka Izagira. He's returning to that group. So he's been in the professional setup of that team since 2007, plus another year before that with the Continental team in 06. 13. Good guess. You never guess, do you? It's not really a guess. You make it sound like a guess. You put a tiny bit of question mark emphasis on it, but it's not really, is it? You're just playing me, aren't you? Julian Alaphilippe, he's playing the breakaway. He's just gone to the back for a moment just to say hello to everybody. Now he straight back to the front. I thought that that group would have taken more time on the yellow jersey group. In fact, it's worked the other way around. Sky have closed it down ever so slightly. This is Tom Yelter Schlachter at the back for Dimension Data. He was in the original breakaway. Sky paying full respect to this move in particular of Mikael Lander. This is the second group on the road. They're just 26 seconds behind the front of the race. Andre Amador, you said it, Robbie. He's a good descender. He's so good. He's taking time out of Julian Alaphilippe on the way down. But also Julian Alaphilippe is limited to what Bob Jungels can handle downhill. So it looks like Lander can descend faster than Jungels. He can let Amador give it everything. In fact, on a braking front, give it nothing. This group on the lower slopes now, almost at the bottom of the descent.
still 80 very difficult kilometers to race and it's through those quick back and forward corners where you see Alaphilippe open up the gap this is Andre Amador he is quick on the way down well he's opened up a gap now so has it got more technical he's ridden away I want to be a little bit careful he's getting wider and wider same. Lander not prepared to take those risks in that spot though the same section where Julian Alaphilippe opened up the gap to the riders that he is with back in the peloton with the yellow jersey is Primoz Roglic he sits in fourth position overall he's only 16 seconds away from a podium spot but it's Chris Froome who is in front of him we spoke to Primoz Roglic before the start of the stage here he is fourth overall Primoz all reading from the same playbook which is the playbook of give them nothing take them nowhere don't give them any information but we know the way Roglic rides we've seen him attack in previous mountain stages when it is just a very small group left at the front of the race he's prepared to go on the attack Lander has proven that he is because he's currently on the move good job being done by Andre Amador strategically it's been very good so far today by Movistar two riders in the earlier breakaway Lander now going across he's putting pressure on a podium position the only thing that may stop Primoz Roglic attacking is thinking about tomorrow's time trial silver medalist at the world championships in the time trial save energy be as fresh as possible don't waste any today gamble on that being enough to get a podium position or test the legs of Chris Froome he cracked two days ago on the Col de Porte when Nara Quintana won the stage. Worth a try, see how it's going. If he feels like it's not working out, go and sit back in the wheels, ride it into the finish. It would be career defining for Primoz Roglic to reach the podium. Currently 16 seconds behind Chris Froome. At the World Championships last year, he got the silver medal. Froome was third, collecting the bronze medal. And he was 24 seconds to the better of Chris Froome. Raphael Micah calling for more drinks, more food. This group of six working really well from what was an original breakaway of 18 riders. Alaphilippe licking his lips in anticipation. He really is enjoying himself this year. He missed out on the tour last year. It was a bitter pill for him to swallow. Had great form early in the season. A knee injury put him out of action for a few months. He had to sit on the couch and watch the tour. And he said it was an experience that he didn't really enjoy. Still, there's been no movement from Sunweb nor Lotto and El Jumbo. They have to wait till the final time of the Coldo Beast. They've joined up at the fronts. It becomes a group of 11, and Andre Amador hasn't wasted any time. He has not just joined the front of the group, he has gone to the front of the group. Amador now setting the tempo. So if we consider that the winner's time should give them an average of around 36 kilometers an hour, based on that, and that the cutoff time on that average will be about 14% of the winner's time, we're looking at about 40 minutes as the delay today. Not very big, considering it's a huge mountain stage, over 4,000 meters of climbing, 4.7 in fact, 200 kilometer stage and only get 40 minutes as the time delay i've said it last week i'm going to say it again today the time cuts are skinny they are severe the leading group of 11 riders the best placed overall in this group is Mikael lander at four minutes and 34 seconds down there is in second position behind his teammate andre amador Bardet is the next best he's at five minutes and 13 seconds down it's then ilna zakarin Followed by Bob Youngles, Warren Barguil, Tanel Kanget, Rafael Micah, Mikael Nievi, Gorka Izaguera, Julian Alaphilippe, 
and Andre Amador. That's the composition of 11 at the front. They're holding on to a lead now of three minutes and 10 seconds. And that moves in the virtual overall standings. I know they don't matter until we reach the finish line, but Mikael Lander is now ahead of Tom Dumoulin in the overall classification. He's up to second place. But Brings him up to a minute 24 from Geraint Thomas. But you see in this group now, this is the yellow jersey group. Jonathan Castroviejo, he is riding like it's a time trial. And he's swapping turns, and I think that's Walt Pools. He's already been doing a bit of work on the climb of the Tourmalade. So they now are riding with the throttle all the way open. This is Andre Amador. Well, he is at the Eglis of the sacrifice. He is putting it all on the line for Movistar. Doing a brilliant job for Mikael Lander. Zakarin just not quite getting the corner right. Something he's become a little bit renowned for in the peloton. Just uh, as they come through the village, change of surface, the small cobblestones, the drain on the inside, and Zakarin nearly got it very wrong. Here at the back, Warren Bagil in the white colours. Fortuneo Samsic in front of him. Bob Jungels, number 105, the Luxembourg champion. Tanel Kanga, number 125 from Astana. The polka dots of Julian Alaphilippe. Gorka Izagiri, Ilno Zakarin, Roman Bardet, Rafael Maika, Mikael Landa, and still Andre Amador just going until he's blowing. He is, he's full gas. He's been full gas for a long time. This is a team Movistar that often get criticised for their tactics, often for being too conservative. And after the stage yesterday, Mikael Lander, he spoke about riding for the team's classification. He was lulling the others into a false sense of security. He's now in the front because Andre Amador, everything he had left, he's left on the road. Amador is done. It's now over to Lander. Well, that section through the valley, Andre Amador has put 15 seconds into the sky chase. So now out to 3 minutes 26. It's now up to Mikael Lander. And he's going on with it. He is one minute and ten seconds away from the yellow jersey in the virtual overall standings. Can he find some allies within that group? Lots of them are here just for the stage victory. They're not worried about their position overall. Stage victory for most of them is the priority. So he goes straight back to the front. Mikel Lander, he swung off. He had a look. Is anyone going to help? Straight back to the front. Don't look for help. Mikel Lander, you're classified better than everybody in this group. Just go. And for the others in this group, he is causing the problems. That's why Sky is chasing. Take us through these climbs as we head up towards the Coldo Beast. Well, it goes up in three big steps. The Category 2, Col de Bourdier. 8.6 kilometres at nearly 6%. Some little steeper sections as they go up the valley. You see that when it turns to black. That is the most difficult. It really eases off over the top. And they get a short descent down into the next valley. Two and a half, three kilometres until they get the foot of the Orbisque, which includes the Col de Solour. 16.6 kilometres, 5% average. But there's a couple of ups and downs along the way. There's that little descent where it changes to grey. Green section as they come around the edge of the mountain and up and over the top. Last section around 7%. So a lot of changes in gradient throughout the whole climb of the Orbisque. There's the Category 2, Col de Bourdier. Small downhill. And then a couple of big steps up to the top of the Orbisque. And from the top there, 20 kilometres of very fast descent. Dropping from just over 1,700 metres above sea level down to less than 500. A drop of 1,200 metres in 18 kilometres. 7.5, 8%. Quick. Super fast. No time to make up time. It's a race to the top of the cold obese and Mikael Lander now he is doing a Stephen Kruisvike but does he have the horsepower to not fade as we saw from Kruisvike on Alp Duez? He doesn't need to attack this group he needs to ride just as hard as he can handle all the way.
So now it's a time trial. What can I maintain? This climb is going to take me 45 minutes. How hard can I ride for the next 45? The finish line is at the top. Yeah, what no the, effort required from then on. The science of it, one of the maximum watts I can do for this period of time at the end of the third week of the Tour de France. That's the scenario, but he's found some support. Julian Alaphilippe is coming through to the front. That's good news for Mikael Lander. Just getting a word from Bob Jungels behind him, his teammate. They're just saying, just settle on the tempo there a little bit. And Mikael Lander, just trying to get a read on what he was doing. Sort of looked for a long time out to his left as if he was just admiring the view and a little sort of pained expression on his face. And that's not 3.6 kilometres to the top of the climb, that's to the start of the climb. So these valley roads... There's always a climb before the climb. Robert Kiesink now. And this is good news for Sky, because Robert Kiesink has gone to the front. Well, Poles has been dropped before he has worked. So the fatigue is starting to build for Sky. No panic, but definitely fatigue. But the good news for them... Robert Hesink going to the front for Lotto and El Jumbo. They're defending the position of Primus Roglic. They're worried about Mikael Lander. And Stephen Kroeswijk sat in sixth this morning, the Dutchman. So Lotto Jumbo, they're going to do their bit. And riders are going overboard from this chasing group behind. Castro Viejo still here. Done a lot of riding. Walt Pools is not on a very good day. But they do still have Michal Kwiatkowski. And they also have Egan Bernal. He's now gone in front of Geraint Thomas. Five Sky Riders left in the group. Stop. They're on the three and a half kilometre climb before the climb starts. As we cut back to the live action, this is now Roman Bardet who is attacking. The response is coming from Mick Outlander. So too Raphael Micah. This attack by Bardet is good news for Lander. The difference between the scenario today by comparison to the stage with Stephen Kruisweik, the riders in the break today are stronger than the ones that Kruisweik was with. So Lander will get more allies and Bardet is one of them. Well, he's attacked over the top of that little climb. As we said, the climb before the climb, short downhill four or five hundred meters or so and they'll start on the Col de Baudet the climb proper 8.6 kilometers and an average of just under six percent little plateau about two-thirds of the way up Julian Alaphilippe just missing the entry to the corner a little bit just a little slide of the front tire he was one-handed he was too busy eating Everybody else is on the brakes, tense, nervous about the corners. He's having lunch. Lander now takes over for Roman Bardet. He knows he's not going to get assistance from the rest of this group. He will, however, from Bardet. No reason to sit up and wait. Keep pushing on, very bumpy down this little descent. Loads of support for Roman Bardet off to the side of the road. Arle Bardet. This is Lawrence Tendan. He's been alongside Tom Dumoulin all day long, offered him moral support. If he needed a drink, Tendan would have provided. Amador now caught by the group that includes his other teammates, Quintana, Valverde and Soler. Well, Jonathan Casaviejo is doing an extremely good ride today for Team Sky. He's been on the front already a lot all the way down the valley road while pools he was blown out as soon as Kiesink started Castroviejo is still there uh, Andre Amador he didn't just drop back to the group he collected bid-ons from the team car and he delivers drinks to the rest of his teammates through he will get back onto them through this little flatter section you can see up the road it kicks up again Warren Bargill, it does not look like it's going to be today a stage win for the Frenchman. He had two last year, plus the King of the Mountains jersey. We'll have to start thinking about 2019. He'll go to the World Championships this year on the French squad, and he could have a top 10 finish there. The course certainly suits him. Meanwhile, it's another Frenchman at the front of this group. It's Julien Alaphilippe once again. Good news for Mikel Lander.
This is Valverde now being distanced. 11th place in the general classification. He doesn't want to hear what the sports directors have to say either. There's nothing more they can say to help in this situation. When you're gone on a day like today, you're gone. And I said about seeing pained expressions on faces. They're starting to drop one by one. People are cracking unexpectedly and very quickly. Just a bit earlier, I saw Geraint Thomas looking uncomfortable for the first time in a long time this far out from the finish. This is David Gaudu. The young Frenchman, he's dropped, just trying to cool things down. That hour and 14 jersey, a lot of that was in the first week. A lot of that. He's a brilliant young climber. Another acceleration, Roman Bardet. Barguil has made contact once again. Gas on, gas off at the front, and the gap now is back down to 239. Maybe some of those steeper sections that go hard up that. Barguil gets distanced. It eases off again. Quite an uneven gradient all the way to the top. So as the gradient kicks up, he's off. It flattens out like this. He rides his way back on. Not a good sign, though, for Barguil. Abandonment of Yala Venender. We said it earlier when he was dropped on one of those climbs at the beginning of the stage. He was dropped with Peter Sagan very early, who was visibly suffering badly. But for Yala Venender to be in that position at that time, there had to be something wrong with him. And we talked about being ill at this end of the tour. It's not you've actually caught something, come down with an actual sickness. It's just your body letting you down. One of the first things to go is your digestive system. That's the beginning of the end. Number 88 hit the front. The gap between the yellow jersey group and the leaders was just on three minutes. Complete exhaustion. What a ride. He is just swerving to maintain enough momentum not to fall over. He wasn't far off, just clipping out. High in the Pyrenees. We've been over the highest paved road of the Pyrenees, the Col de Tourmalet. They're now on their way to the Col d'Orbisque. Still on place. It's now under threat from his own teammate, Mikael Landa. Went into the day. Seventh at 4.34, so a minute and four behind. Nara Quintana. Quintana won't be overly concerned with that. It's a teammate. It doesn't matter. They come over the top of the Category 2 climb. Ken Gert, it is who's leading. Followed then by Zacharin. This is not a sprint for points for the King of the Mountains jersey. This is tempo for survival to see if they can win the stage. Short descent off this climb now, just over two and a half kilometres. They get to go down, take some pressure off the legs. Well, they start the beginning of the Orbisk. Cold Orbis, 16.6 kilometres, average of 4.9%. Not steep because there's little downhill sections and little flat pieces in it. But the real climbing sections are much steeper than that. This looks like the Pic de Midi Wazoo that we're now getting a chance to take a look at. One of the highest points in the Pyrenees at 2,884 metres. Overlooking the Wazoo Valley and this peak it is the symbol for the Po Rugby Union Club. 142. And there's still time to take Musette Bags Sky from the side of the road. There's Quintana. He's just moved forward. He has spotted a Swanier on the side of the road. It looked like a Swanier from the Astana team. He got a nod. Yep, you can have one of these. 3.6 kilometres to the start of the cold obese. There's no rest in between. And this is a tiny group. Number 26, the white jersey, the best young rider, still surviving. That's Pierre Latour. This is Kwiatkowski on the front, followed by Thomas. It's then Bernal, then Froome. Four riders still here for Sky. Dumoulin is in that group on his own for Sunweb, second in the overall classification. Roglic is there for Lotto and Aljumbo, along with Stephen Kruzvak. Fourth and sixth in the overall standings. Nato Quintana is in the group. So too Dan Martin. Domenico Pozzovivo. Damiano Caruso is there. Jon Izaguirre. And Antoine Tolhook is still holding he is, on. He's still there. Group for of 14. For Lotto and Aljumbo. 1.36 the time gap. And the leading group, they are on that descent. Three kilometres descending. One kilometre flat, 
in a small valley and then consistent slopes of eight and eight and a half percent for seven kilometers to what is the top of the Col de Salour. A little bit of flat and then one kilometer of downhill and then onto the final slopes of the Orbisque. Pretty gradual near the top. Just the last three kilometers then at 7%, which will bring them over the top of the Orbisque with 20 kilometers to race all downhill to the finish from there. Without doing a whole lot of work on his own on the climb because he has left a huge gap for him to chase. Give himself about eight or nine seconds to close. 16.6 to the summit. A lot of energy wasted in the process for Ilnar Zakarin. Now they start the climb. Now is a chance to return, but he will pay a price for it. It's really a climb of two seven kilometer climbs. Seven kilometers, eight and a half percent. 1K flat, 1K downhill. Then it's another seven kilometer climb. Begins a e bit easy. Two and a half percent, four and a half, three and a half. That last three K, seven percent. The damage will be done on this first seven kilometers of this climb. This is Bardet rolling through to the front for AG Tuar Le Mondial. On that previous climb, look at the speed back in the yellow jersey group. Much quicker than out in front with Mikael Lander. It's not quite one kilometre the difference in terms of the speed between them. 0.8 of a kilometre. All that work done though, really by Robert Hessing. But I spoke about the pace of Hessing, so intense. How much did it burn the rest of that group? And then the subsequent riders to work on the front. He got it down to 136. It's now back out to 150. Maybe some of that created on the downhill where Sky won't take any risks. But the chasing group, they went up that climb so hard under the pressure of Robert Kiesink. Chapel de Pouet Leon, the old language, it just simply translates as Little Mountain Spring locally also known as the Golden Chapel. Dates back to the 12th century and is another one of the stops on the pilgrimage of the route to Santiago de Compostela. And its floor is built with the local rock from the quarry dating back to 1890. The floor was resurfaced in that period. Michal Kwiatkowski now for Geraint Thomas and Chris Froome. Had people asking if Froome's riding for Thomas, why is he riding behind him? You always have someone behind the yellow jersey. In case he has a mechanical, call it straight away. If he needs a wheel, I wonder if Chris Froome would stop and offer his wheel in that case. But they need to use the others in front. But you always have someone behind the yellow jersey until you're down to your last man. Ilna Zachary now on the climb. Based on what you saw from the previous descents, he needs to break away on this climb. Yeah, by about three minutes. To get a head start. This is Bob Youngles now. He climbs in a really similar manner to Tom Dumoulin. He just goes into time trial mode. He might get dropped a little bit early, paces himself back on. That's the third time he's been dropped today. That's it. Full effort. No tactics required. I don't want to know what's happening behind. It's only a distraction to this effort I'm making. 11% gradients. Raphael Micah clawing his way across. Lander, Bardet, Micah, the rest far in the distance. 14 kilometres to the top. You look at the team tactics that have been played out. Bahrain Merida with Gorka Izaguirre here. Two teammates from Bahrain Merida in that yellow jersey group, Jon Izaguirre and Domenico Pozzovivo. What might have been with Vincenzo Nibali still in the race? These are the cars that were behind the front group of Lander and the rest. They've been pulled to the side to let the Sky-led yellow jersey group come through. Bidons for the riders from Bahrain Merida. Pierre Latour still hanging tough in white. This is as well as he's climbed, and he's climbed well throughout the tour. He's getting better with more pressure. Landa, Bade, and Maika, 25 seconds ahead of the group they just left. 121 ahead of Stephen Kroeswijk, who has 11, 10 seconds on the group of the Mayo Jean. And now we're here in Race Radio, and here's the evidence. It's the attacker Tom Dumoulin.
responding is Roglic. Then it's Geraint Thomas. Froom. Quintana is being distance. That's the ill effects of yesterday's crash, surely. Froom is under pressure. Roglic looking around, wondering. He's got his teammate Kruzvike still up the road. Roglic has a look, trying to assess what any damage is from the attack of Tom Dumoulin. He had to ask the question. Bernal, he comes around on the right side, back to the front, and he will assume control of the group. Tom Dumoulin, he had to ask the question. Still 13.6 kilometres to climb. That was not full-blooded by Tom that Dumoulin. That was a tester. Just a toe in the water. Look at the fight of number 26. We've spoken about how much courage Pierre Latour has. Doesn't need to be spoken about. You can just watch it. Canvas with one knee. Counts to eight. Steps back up. I can go on. So much fight. Another one from Tom Dumoulin. That was a tester. This one's got a bit more on it. Geraint Thomas has got the answer to every question in today's exam. Bernal now waiting with Chris Froome. Well, I think Bernal also doesn't have the explosive power to go with the attack. Got Froome in his wheel, but he keeps checking for him. Trying to ride him back across to this group. They are getting there. Steep section now. Tom Dumoulin up and over it. Chris Froome out of the saddle. Let's go by a metre. Two. He's not quite back as yet. He's close. Roglic will like this. He's the rider sitting in third position. Froome pedalling a really high cadence. Suffering like he hasn't suffered before in the Tour de France. This is really challenging Froome. A four-time winner of the race. He's showing his spirit and his champion character. He's holding on. This Bernal. is good for Landa. Attacks coming from Tom Dumoulin. Stop start. That is very good for Mikael Landa. This will really burn the riders in this group and give Landa a chance to open that gap out even more. 12.9 from the top. The middle section is really quite easy. Little piece of downhill, another bit of flat. Section at 2.5% only, no more than false flat. This is Landa Bardet, Rafael Maker. And Mikael Landa no longer too worried about having a few passengers. He's time trialling to the top of the climb. Last year, they had just returned to the group. Dan Martin, Captain Courageous, attacks. The stage de la Rossier. Dan Martin was dropped. He came back to the group. Bam, straight over the top. On that occasion, Chris Froome went with him. Today, not even thinking about it. He did remind Geraint Thomas last night that he got the better of him at the Junior Tour of Wales. They've had a bit of fun between the two of them. They've got a great relationship, a huge amount of respect between the two, but they're no longer friends when they're on the road. Once they're racing, they are rivals. Huge respect between them. Dan Martin, he wants more out of this race. This is the race for the podium. This is Roglic, Froome is chasing. It's then Dumoulin and Thomas. The expression on his face tells you he might have a little bit more. Bernal is now distanced, but trying to fight his way back. He goes past Pozzo Vivo. Roglic catches Dan Martin. And Froome now, he's fighting for third and defending the position of first for Thomas. That is the ultimate domestique. Well, for the first time in this Tour de France, Chris Froome is really doing the chasing. They've relied on Egan Bernal for so long. Outside of that, Froome has been dropped. Now, Dan Martin, he made an attack. He's been pushed out the back door. Chris Froome, he looked a little bit in trouble with that attack of Roglic, and he hasn't completely closed it yet. It's opening back up. And Froome, with all that chasing, is exposing himself to being vulnerable. And now we're seeing the chase from Dumoulin trying to defend his position in the overall standings. Well, let's see Froome. He is being distanced by Tom Dumoulin and Geraint Thomas. Froome now getting dropped. 
So Dumoulin, he rides across to the wheel of Primoz Roglic. Geraint Thomas comfortably with him. Chris Froome is always looking up, looking down, looking around. Can he spin his way back on this time? He is suffering. The four-time winner of the tour, Chris Froome. What we do know is he will not surrender. He'll fight all the way through to the finish line. Roglic and Dumoulin. Roglic racing for Slovenian sporting history. A spot on the podium at the Tour de France. Primoz Roglic, he takes a big bite out of the advantage of Chris Froome and he's liking the taste. 16 seconds the difference this morning. And Chris Froome is going further behind. He is really starting to fade now Froome. He will be hoping for the return of Egan Bernal. He's maintaining that famous high cadence. He needs to rely on this group then starting to look at each other, but Roglic, there is no backing down. Kurzweig sees him coming. Has he got anything in the tank to help the pace of Roglic? Still, he gets to the wheel. 11 kilometers to climb. On, 11K to climb. But they're almost at the top of this steep section. Eight, eight and a half percent gradients the whole way on average. Then they get a flat kilometre, a downhill kilometre, and then an easy section. So they can kiss, keep Chris Froome out of the wheel over the top. Then Kroosvake and Roglic are doing some good business. And it's Roglic going to the front. Kruzvik holding on to the back, Dumoulin in second position, and Geraint Thomas looks unflappable. He does. Roglic, he needn't worry about Dumoulin, nor about Geraint Thomas. Stay on the front, ride all the way to the finish. He's attacking Chris Froome. He's riding for a podium position in Paris. Enormous performance by Primez Roglic. From a junior world champion in ski jumping, across to cycling, and now he is rising to the top. The world's biggest bike race and a podium finishes within his reach. This is at the front. This is the race for stage honours. Mick Lander, followed by Raphael Maika, Roman Bardet, and about to rejoin them, Ilmar Zakarin. Well, Zakarin, he has fought all the way. He gave himself a big job to do. Dropped on the little downhill. So even if he gets back on, it's not looking good for the Russian to stay with these riders anyway. 39 seconds, 37, the gap back to Roglic. He is towing Dumoulin and Thomas across the gap. Jungels now, and Gorka Izagiri trying to get back on terms with the Lander group. There at the midway point, 18 seconds behind the leaders on the road, almost caught by the Roglic-led group. Roglic still going. Opening up now, 17 seconds his advantage on the road over Chris Froome. In the distance, the targets to chase now for Roglic, Izegira and Jongles. Kroosvake just hanging in there. Chris Froome now coming through that same bend. He has lost 12 or 14 seconds now. Chris Froome. That in front of him is Kangert of Astana, who was in the earlier breakaway. He's falling further and further behind now. Chris Froome is at 17, 18 per sec seconds behind this group on the road. If Kresla can hang on to this group over the top of this steep section, they get a kilometre of flat, kilometre of down, then some gentle slopes before it kicks up in the last three kilometres to the Orbis. Stephen Kresla has got to go to the front. How about this? Egan Bernal makes his way back to Chris Froome. Dan Martin is also there, but Egan Bernal, we've said it so many times, but it's worth repeating, he is the youngest rider in the race. Extraordinary performance by Egan Bernal, the Colombian sensation. Oh, he's a Colombian gold nugget, and he could be the man that gets Chris Froome back on terms with that front group, but a lot of work to do. Froome can also descend very well. There's a chance of coming back on the 20 kilometer downhill if he can limit the damage to the front group. I expect Kroosvijk to be sent to the front on the easier sections to keep the pace high for Roglic. Here's a repeat of the attack of Roglic from the front. He just sensed a moment of weakness with Chris Froome. 
So he went for it. He saw him closing it and then not quite getting to the wheel. So he stuck the knife in a little bit deeper. And it was rusty. This is the suffering face of the Luxembourg champion, Bob Youngles, being caught by the Roglic Dumoulin Thomas Kruisweik group. Roglic can't afford to settle for the rhythm of Bob Youngles. When it's too easy, you've got to keep going, keep moving on, because now the chase, Dan Martin with Bernal, Chris Froome will contribute when he can. He can't. He's struggling to stay with them. Dan Martin works out to be an ally for Froome in some respects. He's trying to defend his position, but Froome needs Bernal to stick with him. These riders over the top of the steep section, they'll get a little downhill coming up soon. So a chance to just to rest the legs for a couple of kilometres. And Froome is out to 30 seconds behind the Roglic Thomas Dumoulin group. With Bob Youngle still setting the tempo, so Roglic trying to recuperate just momentarily. Follows over the top, they get onto that flat section. Only now 30 seconds behind the lead of the race. Dan Martin, few lengths to Egan Bernal, and another few metres to Chris Froome. Bob Youngles, the temperature drops up the top, get the jersey done up, get aero, little downhill, flatter sections, and they're nine kilometers from the top of the orbisk but it's just the last three kilometers of it that are at seven percent the rest is much shallower from really suffering being dropped by dan martin just in the last few hundred meters his tank is empty keep it in context with the amount of successive grand tours he's ridden and won last year he won the tour de france then won the Volta de Spagna. this year winning the giro d'italia this is the fourth in a row, aiming for the win. Sure, he's fading, but he's still holding on to a top five place. Well, it had to come eventually. And he's proving he is only human. Off the front, Mikel Lander, he's been the man doing the damage today. An audacious attack on the Tourmalet from Mikel Lander. Well supported by Andre Amador. Got him into this situation here with Bardet, Maika and Zakarin. Oh, Zakarin. He's already in trouble on this descent. And this is only a kilometre long. Lucky for him. Cyclists in the miss as they head towards the top of the obisk. It's Lander, Bardet, Raphael Micah, and the very wobbly Ilna Zakarin. Someone needs to teach him to hold on in the drops of those handlebars. Kroosweik now to the front of this group. So hung on, now it's up to him. Set the pace on this downhill, little flat section, and easier gradients. So once they get off this downhill, it's 2.5% for a kilometre, 4.5% for a kilometre. The next two are only 3.5%. They can really work together, open the gap up over Chris Froome. That final 3K up and over the top, 7% gradients and then all downhill to the finish. Over that previous crest, their gap on through 30 seconds. This is the front of the race. Zachary does the jersey up. Bardet at the front, they're looking at each other. Bardet backs himself as a descender. If he's caught by the group with the yellow jersey, Garant Thomas, he'd still fancy his chances on the way down the Coldo Beast. And he'll have to, because I don't think he's got the sprint to beat two out of the other three. The only one he'd beat in the sprint, I think, is Ilnar Zakarin. I think so. And that'd be a photo finish. Zakarin certainly won't follow Bardet downhill. Nato Quintana. That's the crash from yesterday. Well, the gains that he made two days ago on the uphill finish, they are out the window. But he has a stage win, and it was an epic stage win. Hasn't it been a great tour, but it has been a good tour for Nato Quintana. Now Egan Bernal, they've caught back up with Dan Martin. For Team Sky's sake, I hope their contract with Egan Bernal is a long one because there'll be a queue of team managers lining up at the door searching for the signature of Egan Bernal. Incidentally, the team manager, Dave Brailsford, asked the question yesterday about Garant Thomas, whose contract runs out at the end of this year. He has said, contract's not signed, but he will be with the team next year. We wait for confirmation. Bob Young will super ride today. He holds on to the yellow jersey group. 
Primoz Roglic on the front of this group, riding purely for a podium place. It's Roglic versus Bernal, and the gap is 16 seconds. Bernal is closing, and it was that moment across the top where they took some time to do the jerseys up, grab a bite to eat. It's given Bernal a chance to close it down again for Chris Froome. 17 seconds, the gap now. The gap this morning on GC, 16. It is tight. The leaders, Rafael Maika. Now it is at Mikael Lander. Well, a different level of intensity. This group to the one behind, they're now into 20 seconds. They've lost 10 seconds on that little downhill section. All starting to look at each other. Maika most certainly thinking only about the stage win. And I would imagine Bardet is too. He's too far back on GC now. Whether he finishes 8th, 6th, 10th or 27th doesn't matter a whole lot. People will talk about who won the tour and epic stage wins. And that's what Bardet would love to get himself. He is in with a chance. He's won three stages throughout his career. He's made two appearances on the podium. One second, one third. And Froome, the four-time winner, is about to return to the yellow jersey group, courtesy of Egan Bernal. Superb job by the 21-year-old Colombian, bringing them across the gap. But he's not out of trouble yet, Chris Froome. It is an uber performance by Egan Bernal of five-star ratings. Whatever that ride cost, it was well worth the fee for Chris Froome. 25 kilometres at the front of the race. Zacharin at the front, followed then by Bardet, Rafael Micah for Bora Hansgrohe, and Mikael Lander, just 15 seconds their advantage. Two kilometres of gentle slope, just three and a half percent gradient. Then three kilometres at seven percent. Chris Froome, by far not out of the woods yet. He'll hang in at these gradients, but Kroswijk has gone again. There he is, just in the distance. He's only momentarily slipped away. Great timing by the Dutchman as everything came together. Everybody looking around, assess the damage, see who's there. Kroswijk says, you look at each other, I'm out of here. And Primoz Roglic, even if he finishes on the same time today as Chris Froome, would take confidence out of this performance that he can gain those 16 seconds tomorrow to move up onto the podium for Sunday. Absolutely. Kroosvijk, the nearly man of the Giro d'Italia in 2016. The nearly man of Alpe d'Huez in 2018. And he's trying to ride his way across to this group. They go back into the mist. Maker, Landa, Bardet and Zakarin head start onto this descent. He knows that Team Sky don't want to take massive risks downhill with Geraint Thomas. Bardet, however, with Lander, trying to ride back into the wheel of Maker. This is not quite the tet of the course, because Raphael Maker is still in front of these two. Lander and Bardet. Zacharin has been caught by the yellow jersey group. And another move. It's Steven Kruisweik once again. Bernal reacts, looks over his shoulder to Froome. Is this okay? A launching pad, just perhaps for Primez Roglic. Gorka is a gear. The first signs of the body language, the only signs of body language from Izagira that he's suffering is the one nod of the head. Here's Maker, he's alone. He's opening up the gap to Landa and to Bardet. There they are coming through the corner, very closely behind them will be Kroosweik, followed by Bernal. Maker with 10 seconds lead. He just keeps on fighting. Does not know how to surrender, nor does this man. It's a poker look of concentration from Mick Outlander. You can't quite see the suffering, but I can assure you he really is. So too is this brave Colombian. It's Nato Quintana, the winner on stage 17. Start of the day in fifth trying to find a defender top 10 finish but losing a big chunk of time this afternoon he's out to three minutes behind that's his gap on the road he started the stage at 3.30 well at the moment it'll push him out to seven minutes and that will put him 
back in ninth spot. Raphael Micah rapidly approaching the top of the cold obese. Being climbed for the 73rd time in the history of the Tour de France. The first time was way back in 1910, more than 100 years ago. Bob Youngles keeps on charging. Bernal has been dropped because the attack is on and the attack is on from Primaz Roglic. Step aside, Mikhail Lander. Roglic is on his way. Roglic rides through Bardet and Lander. They try to get on the wheel and follow. Stephen Kreiswijk, Zakarin, Martin hanging on the back. Chris Froome looking a little bit better this time under the attack. Tom Dumoulin, he's closing the gap slowly but steadily. Stuck to his wheel, Geraint Thomas. Like glue, Roglic the check across the shoulder. Dumoulin takes a big breath. He's made contact. Flick of the elbow from Primoz Roglic. That's going to allow Chris Froome to ride his way back into the wheel. It does. He makes contact. And now Dumoulin, does he have anything in the tank? He's tried one or two smaller attacks. But it's easy to say, why don't you attack? It's so much more difficult to do when you're at your limits. There's hardly anybody left in this group. And Chris Froome, the super domestique, is doing exactly what he said he would do. He's going to the front to ride defensively for Thomas as Kreuzweit was trying one more time. There was a big look to Primoz Roglic. I'm not sure if there were words there as well. He's better off just saving his breath. Raphael Micah, one kilometre. 13 seconds, that's his advantage. Here comes Kruzvik, there goes Bardet. And Bardet, he's making the charge, looking for a stage win. Roglic uses the steep ramp to go on the attack again. Primos Roglic, distancing Chris Froome, five, six, seven metres. Froome spinning up a storm behind, but Roglic is going away. He's found himself a little bit of a gap. How much can he open up? Bardet is staying with Primez Roglic. Tom Dumoulin says, Chris Froome, that's not fast enough. Let me have a piece of the action. Dumoulin it is who's closing it down to Roglic. The yellow jersey just maintains his position. He's riding flawlessly. Raphael Maker, he fights on, 7-8% gradient. Roglic is coming at him with Bardet in the wheel. Dumoulin again, closing the gap. And as always, Geraint Thomas, straight in the wheel of the Dutchman. Chris Froome at the back of the group. It's splitting up, Dan Martin is off. Kruiswijk is dropped. Chris Froome, a couple of metres back to him. And this time, Roglic, he keeps going. Almost at the top now, the cold obese. Just 400 metres remaining for Rafael Micah. It is a slender lead, but he is a good descender. He's in with a chance. Can he possibly hold them off? Oh, the gap shrinking. Roglic going on with it. He's gotten rid of Froome. He's got to go over the top. How much risk do you take on the way down to gain such a small gap? We saw what happened to Adam Yates trying to hold off the charge of Alaphilippe. And the risk that was taken just a couple of days ago by Philip Gilbert. It is a big risk for a small gain for Primoz Roglic. Raphael Micah, he crosses the top of the Coldo piece. This is the Froome group. A little bit of distance. Kruzvik in front of him. Five seconds is the gap. This is Primez Roglic, followed by Dumoulin. It is then Geraint Thomas. Now it's the top of the climb for Raphael Micah. He's almost got lockjaw as he twists and turns his way to the top of the coal. And Roglic keeps the pressure on behind all the way to the top. Raphael Maker, he's holding about seven seconds over the chasing group. He's about to hit the descent. 20 kilometres to go as he goes over the top of the Orbisk. No drinks, no service needed, sunglasses on, time to dive. And here comes Roglic. He's flown through ski resorts before to a junior world title in ski jumping. Now he's trying to jump onto the podium of the Tour de France. Roglic will get told that Froome is almost on the back. That will be good news for Rafael Micah. If Froome can get himself back on, the pressure may come off at the front of this group. 
and Maker can open the gap. I'm a little nervous about the man in red, Ilnar Zakarin, on this descent. It's a descent that you know well. Froome needs to get past him. The upper slopes, bumpy, a little bit steeper, very tight hairpins. Lower down, it opens up. It is super, super fast. Roglic still at the front, followed by Dumoulin. Then Thomas, Bardet, Lander, Kruzweig, Zakarin, and this is Froome at the rear of the group. That's the composition of the yellow jersey group chasing Rafael Maika. About close the gap to Rafael Maika. He is pushing hard and he's making the rest of the group take every risk in the book. Well, we can't really see what is happening at the front of this group, but for Roglic, can he take the risk that could put Geraint Thomas under pressure? Geraint Thomas has had, he has enough of a buffer. He's 159 ahead of Tom Dumoulin. He can afford to just give a little bit of distance down here. Even if he was to concede 20 seconds or so by the end of the stage, it's better than crashing and conceding at all. Everything back together at the front. And Zachary, where was this on the previous descents? The technique is still awful, but it's much, much more effective. A little bit more open, the corners on this descent. And a lot of good wheels to follow as well, so you can gauge the corners a lot better. You can see what's happening in the front of the group. Adjust his speed, braking point, follow the lines of the others who are doing it well. Roglic still has them under pressure. The former ski jumper, he might have jumped off the ski hill, but he's also done plenty of downhill, and he's opening up a gap to the man behind him, Rafael Maika. It is a small gap, but it is a gap nonetheless. He's letting it all hang out. This is a guy who knows about taking risks. Zachary Froome, smart. He's moved past Ilmar Zachary. He's now got Stephen Kroeswijk in front of him. I would say he's still rattled from a couple of years ago in the Giro. Downhill, not his forte. And Tom Dumoulin has recognised this threat. He has moved past Rafael Maika. He's closing in on Primoz Roglic. Dumoulin a good descender, but everybody being forced to go to their limit on this downhill. Fingers crossed they all get down in one piece. Just watching this footage, everybody at home, I really hope you don't suffer from motion sickness. This is hair raising. Roglic pushing so hard. Dumoulin on the chase. Geraint Thomas Zucker in with a wobble through the corner. Two bites at the cherry to get through that one. And Froome has also gone past Kruzweig. Lock up for Zucker in. You see the smoke coming off the tyre. You'd be better off losing 10 or 15 seconds and staying upright. Those two riders crashed on the same day at the Giro d'Italia and it cost them both enormously. It cost them the rest of the season as well as the result in the Giro. Zakarin, Kroeswijk, the gap opening up to Froome in front of them. And there is no runoff on this road. The walls either side, the cliff face, underneath the banner, 15 kilometres. Your heart breaks, doesn't it, for Naro Quintana? Yep. Hurt yesterday in that nasty crash mid-stage and what was a straightforward day must have cost him some energy too that big attack to win the stage but as you said it was an epic nothing to be ashamed of going out the back today and should still finish top 10 well if he can defend it in the time trial that is another question of course the group splitting up slightly Chris Froome not in the wheels of the first five or six closing it down he is just about there now. You can see that time gap to Nato Quintana, 4.45. Roglic, Dumoulin, Thomas, Bardet, Lander, Micah, Dan Martin, Chris Froome. He's not in the wheel. He's working hard to get there. This is Kruzweig at the back at Zakarin. Zakarin still up on the brake hoods. Zakarin 12th at 11 minutes 31. He doesn't need to take the big risk. The gain is minimal. At the front, Roglic is just going on with this. He knows he's making Froome pedal all the way down, take big risks. Could be the way to get rid of him. The gap is getting bigger. Remember Roglic descending to his win at Serre Chevalier? He knows what he's doing on a downhill. 
That was last year, his first appearance at the tour. This is just Primus Roglic's third Grand Tour. And he's on target to knock Chris Froome off the podium and move up to third place. Close your eyes. No, it's okay, open them now. Zacharin has made it through. Froome still trying to chase across that gap. He's now in front of Dan Martin and closing it on the wheel of Rafael Maika. In front of Maika in the blue, Mikael Landa. Bardet in the yellow jersey, looking comfortable. Grant Thomas, his descending had been questioned. He's up to the task at the moment. And rightly so it had been questioned, but he's had the answers. He's so tough, Grant Thomas. He finished the Tour de France in 2013 after crashing on day one and fracturing his pelvis. He finished the race 140th. He supported Chris Froome. He has so much fight in him. There he is in yellow in third position on the wheel of Dumoulin, who is stalking Primez Roglic. Incidentally, in the race to survive, Peter Sagan is 31 minutes and 42 seconds behind the front of the race. He should be just about right on the time limit and be okay to start again tomorrow. How frustrating is this for a team manager? Ilnar Zakarin, good enough to go with them on the climb, misses out on a chance to win the stage based on skill level, descending ability. Let's say he could even stay here. He's not going to beat these guys for the stage win in a sprint, but it's definitely frustrating for his team manager. It's frustrating as a former rider to see someone just not be able to follow the rest on a downhill that is not very technical at all. It's poor technique. It can be learnt. It can be learnt. Chris Froome seems to have done it. He has done it. But Zacharin, remember a couple of years ago, that fall you mentioned in the Giro, high speed and descent, flew into a field, fractured his pelvis. That takes a long time to get over mentally. Psychologically, it's very difficult for him to take risks, and he just doesn't have the technique. Yeah. And that was before the crash. That was before he didn't have it. So now he doesn't have the technique and he's rattled. Primus Roglic is not rattled, but he's trying to rattle the cage of all of his rivals. Stage win would be nice, along with the time bonus. He started the day 16 seconds behind Chris Froome. He was 24 seconds quicker than Chris Froome in the time trial world championships last year. 10 kilometres to go. Roglic still up on the pedals, and it's Tom Dumoulin chasing in second wheel. Geraint Thomas tucked down behind him. Bardet, Froome, Lander. Tom Dumoulin, is, he's another rider who's been really composed throughout this race. We're back with Nairo Quintana. Kroeswijk and Zakarin signalled at 15 seconds behind the lead group, led by Primoz Roglic. Two seconds to Tom Dumoulin, chasing him all the way down. Good skills, Tom Dumoulin. The more corners, the better it is for Roglic. He opens the gap up just a little bit more on every corner. It's on the big straights. They just start to wind their way back in. Tom Dumoulin, time trial pedigree. He won't let him go that easy. He's a smart man, Tom Dumoulin. His parents couldn't understand why he wanted to race a bike. Both of his parents have PhDs, and they figured, just get an education, get a good job, life will be fine. Well, life on the bike, it can be tough, but also so rewarding, and I'm sure they'd be extremely proud of their man, Tom Dumoulin, today, chasing Roglic. There he is in white, just in front of the yellow jersey. That is first and second in the overall classification. This man, Roglic, started in fourth, is making an impression on third. Onto the top tube, getting aero. Pop back out, hit the apex on the power as soon as possible. Dan Martin behind, Rafael Maker, Lander in front of him. Chris Froome, been losing metres here and there, but still well within contact to the group. Playing it a little bit safe too, watching the lines, letting others take the big risks, then assessing, and then cornering. Well, it's 
all the way downhill until the three kilometre to go mark. Then there's a little uphill section to the two kilometre marker. The final two Ks are predominantly downhill. Twisting into the finish as well. Come under the kilometre, it's downhill, sharp right hand corner, then a sharp left and it slings its way through to the finish line. This is the biggest gap we've seen from Primoz Roglic. Maybe a little mistake in the background from Tom Dumoulin. And when they get, or they lose sight of him, they're having to pick their own line, and he's clearly better than the others. That gives him a chance to start to stretch the advantage. Once they can't see him going in and through the corner, big advantage for Roglic and the gap will continue to stretch wider. He's just getting out of sight into the corners. It's perfect for him. And Dumoulin is looking over the shoulder, saying who's going to give some assistance. That's a sign. Six seconds is the advantage for Primaz Roglic. Thomas is relaxed. I'll just have a drink. Well, the gap for Geraint Thomas to Primaz Roglic is 2 minutes and 47 seconds. He won't be overly concerned with only 6.4 kilometres to go. His priority is to stay safe. Roglic is making a run at second overall, not just a podium place. He's been looking so good all day. The man on the attack on the harder sections of the climb and a world championship silver medalist in the time trial. For one, he'll be hard to catch and I think he's going to get the stage win today. And tomorrow, he could even overhaul Tom Dumoulin as well as Chris Froome already today. You will have seen the graphic indicating that Peter Sagan is at 32 minutes and 40 seconds behind. Here's Froome. Froome now goes to the front. He wants to chase Primez Roglic because Roglic is moving past Chris Froome in the overall standings and onto the podium. Or two up chase, Froome, Dumoulin versus Primoz Roglic. And for mine, the stage has been won. Roglic it is. Off the front. Six seconds his advantage. That was the latest from Race Radio. Sprinting out of each corner with his morale just boosting further and further. I'm calling it nine seconds. Timed on feel. Froome swings across, Dumoulin doesn't take over, the gap extends again, it'll be out over 10 now. And Froome adjusting the earpiece, but Garrett Thomas, thinking about tomorrow, has not put his nose in the wind at all. Dumoulin's been working, Roglic has been working, Froome has been working, the yellow jersey Thomas has just been following. He'll be ever so slightly fresher before the time trial tomorrow. Just riding intelligently and with a cool head. Four kilometres to go for Primoz Roglic. The bulk of the descending done. It's a lot more pedalling descent, a gentle gradients down to the finish now. A couple of big hairpins still to come at the bottom of this section before the road opens back up. Brings him into the outskirts of Laron. Dumoulin at the front of the yellow jersey group. Thomas sits just behind him. This is the section where it just kicks up for a little bit for Primoz Roglic. Soon. Still Once, plenty of punch. Once he gets inside the three kilometre marker, there's just a little uphill rise. Out of every corner, full sprint, not looking like he's fading or struggling. Pure power, perfectly aligned. He's going further away. Roglic, uh, Dresvog and Zakarin. Zakarin looking so awkward around each corner. Kruzvaj, he's done a lot of work today for this man. The World Championship silver medalist in the time trial is in that time trial position and the gap is opening up even further. They can't see him. He's out of sight. They're just coming out of that bend. He is well out of sight of the chasing group led by Chris Froome. Dumoulin second, Geraint Thomas, Bardet, Mikael Landa, Raphael Maika, Daniel Martin. He's off in the distance and they're sending neutral service up on the motorbike. They can't see him. They saw the motorbike. They still did not see Primoz Roglic. 15 seconds according to Race Radio. At the start of the day, the gap between Roglic and Froome 
was 16 seconds. He's attacked them on the uphill, they came back. He hit them again. They clawed their way back. He went to the front of the downhill and said, follow this. They couldn't. They tried and no, they couldn't. And now it's Roglic, free as a bird, soaring through the mountains of the Pyrenees. Two kilometres. Slight uphill through the village. Then it goes down again. Primoz Roglic is nearly home. 17 seconds the gap. He has gone past Chris Froome on general classification. He's taking a big step forward towards the podium. And Dumoulin, he rates him. He fears Roglic in the time trial tomorrow. The gap between those two in the overall standings at the start of today's stage was 48 seconds. Primez Roglic is threatening Dumoulin's second place. With a time bonus, if Tom Dumoulin doesn't get into the first three, the difference will be 21 seconds if the gap stays the same. Raphael Micah going to the front. He wants a chance at the stage, but that is slipping through his fingers. And the yellow jersey, Geraint Thomas, composure. Watches calmly. And Thomas to sprint for second. Time bonus for second, six seconds. Thomas has ridden a fantastic race. He has been exceptional. The one kilometre kite. It was a stage win last year at his first attempt. But Downhill, sharp right hander. And then it is left again. He'll see the finish line. Hanging over the bike like it's MotoGP. Perfect. McEwen is happy with the form of Primez Roglic. Now underneath the kite, it's Dumoulin still chasing. Dumbo with their third stage victory. Two for the sprinter, one for the climber. He's in the third place overall. And in the group, Robert Hiesink laying it on the line, riding to the point of exhaustion that he was swerving across the road. It all served to set up this man, Primoz Roglic. And the sprint for second place. Very important. We knew Geraint Thomas was going to want to take the seconds. He's extended over everybody except Primoz Roglic. And that final 150 metres was the first time Geraint Thomas had his nose in the wind today. This is Jungels, Gorka Izagiri, and Egan Bernal. Oh, starring role for the young Colombian. Bob Jungels in the break today. Solid ride by Jungels. Likewise, Izagiri, the same with Bernal. They're all heroes this afternoon, every single one of them. The descent of Primez Roglic. 19 seconds was the gap on the line. So Roglic is now up to third place in the overall standings. Bardet finished well in third on the stage. We have been treated to a 100 kilometer finale. Yes. Fantastic stage. There it is. And look at the gap between Roglic and Dumoulin. It is just 19 seconds. That could go either way tomorrow in the time trial. Surely it's enough two minutes and five seconds for Geraint Thomas to defend his lead in yellow. But the battle for second, third, and the unfortunate fourth is tight, really tight. The peloton has raced through the mountains. The Pyrenees are behind them, but they still cast a shadow over the final big test. It's not just a race for yellow, where Thomas is aiming to hold on. It's a battle for spots on the podium. The individual time trial, it's the test of truth. Saint-Pierre, Nival, that hosts the stage start. It's Espelette, the stage finish. This is very much the heart of the Basque country. Yes, we are still in France, but it is Basque territory. And the race to reign today tells the story of this region. Don't pay too much attention to the course profile. It simply does not do it justice. There's barely a straight stretch of road, 
nor a flat stretch of road. Hello and welcome to stage 20 of the Tour de France. Matthew Keenan and Robbie McEwen with you. Robbie, the race of truth, and this will be a really difficult test. This will be an extremely difficult test, not just the terrain which you mentioned, winding roads, and that profile says nothing about the course. It is so hilly, it's in fact too hilly to draw them all onto the profile. And the big talking point today is it is wet. The first wet day in the Tour de France since it started back in the Vendée. We've had 10 minutes of rain in the whole tour. That was a few days ago. Nothing more than a brief cooling shower. But today it is properly wet. There's confirmation of the stage result. Dumoulin from Froome, then Thomas Kwiatkowski, Anderson, Jongels, Zacharin, Roglic, Soler and Hepburn in 10 must feel for Roglic but so much to like about it. Fifth for Kruisweik, outstanding time trial for Bardet to move up to sixth, Lander in seventh, Martin in eighth, Zacharin in ninth and Quintana slipped to tenth. After more than 3,200 kilometres of racing from the Vendée up to Brittany, through the Alps, the Massive Centrale and the Pyrenees, all that awaits is the Champs-Élysées in Paris. 116 kilometres remaining with the yellow jersey firmly secured on the shoulders of Geraint Thomas. From Huy through to Paris, it's the Champs-Élysées with the famous laps along the boulevard. The dream finish for the sprinters, not that there are many left in this year's race. It's 116 kilometres, a lot of it early processional, but once they get into the heart of the city, that is when the racing will be on. Hello and welcome to Paris for the 21st and final stage of this year's Tour de France. As always, Matthew Keenan with you, joined by a man who won on this boulevard in 1999. For the first time at least, Robbie McEwen. Robbie, nice to be back in Paris. Always nice to be back in Paris and the Champs-Élysées, for any former rider of the Tour, brings back lots of memories. Some good, some bad, some better than excellent. But for everybody, always a massive sense of relief to reach this location. Whatever the result on the final stage, and whether you're a sprinter gunning for the, the win or just getting yourself home, it is that relief of finally I've made it, the sense of accomplishment. No matter how many times you've done it, it feels special. And the man that's done it the most in terms of starts, that is Sylvain Chavanel. We'll celebrate him throughout today's stage in his 18th Tour de France, finishing it for the 16th time. Today, riding his 368th Tour de France stage. Some of the key favourites, the big stars of the race, they've been introduced to the crowd in Huy, which is hosting the stage start. Five years ago, it hosted the start of Paris-Nice with a prologue. In that opening prologue, it was Damien Goudin who managed to win the stage and take the first leader's jersey. He's in the race today, and so far throughout this year's tour, Damien Goudin has been very active, getting himself into multiple breakaways, which you can say for just about everybody across its direct energy. Weather conditions, not particularly hot, not cool either, no rain, but the major factor today will be the wind. It's quite gusty here down at the finish line, and I expect that that will have somewhat of an impact on the sprint finish. Well, Matt, I took the opportunity to ride a bike in to the Champs-Élysées from our hotel about five or six kilometres away, and... It is very blustery here in Paris today. It is down some of the streets, really funneling between the buildings, and it's really quite a strong wind. We'll see how that goes throughout the afternoon and how that will affect the finish. This stage never going to split due to crosswinds or something like that, but it's always a question of timing for the sprinters, depending on which way the wind is blowing. Quite often, though, the weather just seems to go completely still and perfect going into the final lap. Well, the few times that I've taken a little bit of a walk along the Champs-Élysées so far today, there's been a couple of occasions where it's been a headwind finished and a few other occasions where it's felt like a tailwind finished. Yeah, it is really swirling. As the riders are starting to mill around the start, they're also keen to get it underway. And although it's only a 116 kilometre stage, 
it's a long afternoon. Is it a stressful afternoon as a sprinter, the early processional Absolutely. part? Absolutely. You just want, you'd actually prefer to get riding at around 40 kilometres an hour average, get in here and, and race for the finish rather than that procession that we will see. Because as a, as a sprinter, you want to get down to business and the longer you're out there, the more the stress builds. Chance to take a look at La Défense, which is part of the historical Parisian access with the Palais de Louvre, the Avenue de Champs-Élysées, the Arc de Triomphe and the Newly Bridge. This is the largest business district in Europe. It was created, the business district, back in 1960. But the most famous element of La Défense is the Grand Arch that was tramped up and inaugurated by President Francois Mitterrand in July of 1989, the year of the bicentennial, the French Revolution. And it also coincided with the gathering of the heads of state for the G7 summit. It was also the year of the great eight second Tour de France when it ended on the Champs Elysees with an individual time trial. And the great American Greg LeMond managed to win the tour by eight seconds ahead of the Parisian Laurent Fignon. Sunweb off to the left. That's Lawrence Tendam who is leading in the black and white colours. Stage win yesterday. Stage win today, Nicky Azan. Outside chance, I know, but... Outsider. There's a lot of teams that have Nicky come Zahn up... Nicky and Edward Turns as a tandem. Yeah, it's a good tandem. A lot of teams come up short, just quickly, the stage victories. Two stages for Sky, one for Sunweb, one for Movistar, one for BMC, one for UAE Emirates. Four at Quickstep, three at Bora Hansgrohe, two at Astana, one at Group Armour FDJ, three at Lotto and El Jumbo, and one at Trek Segafredo. That leaves a lot of teams, a lot of big teams, without a win. Education First Draft Pack, AG2R, Bahrain Merida, Mitchelton Scott, Dimension Data, Katusha, Lotto Sildal, that's of the World Tour teams, and then each of the wildcard teams, Fortuneo Samsung, Kofidis, Wanty Group, Goubert and uh, Direct Energy without a stage victory. They haven't won stages, those wildcard teams. They've certainly won a lot of fans and admiration from, I even think, plenty of riders in the peloton, the way they've taken on the race. Just constantly in the attack, especially Direct Energy. None of the big prizes, but so active. This is, I would say, Sylvain Chavanel just riding off the front of the peloton. And it is the man who's about to complete his 18th Tour de France, the record holder. Do you like this? Yeah, I think it's a great show of respect from the bunch for a man who's ridden so many tours in what is to be his final Tour de France. Let him go off up the road. The finish line is on the other side of the Arc de Triomphe. Sylvain Chavanel making his way up to the Arc de Triomphe, part of the Golden Triangle. He is in his 18th Tour de France. 19 seconds now the advantage for Sylvain Chavanel. He will have spoken to riders at the front of the peloton. They will allow him to ride through the finish line for the first time on his own. And I suspect that we might see a few waves from him as he comes through the finish line of the Champs-Élysées for the first time. To the Place de la Concorde. And as they are coming into the last couple of kilometres, this corner is always quite difficult. The combination of that right-hander, this left-hander, you get a little bit caught out on the inside and lose a few positions. Really important to get those two just right. Don't leave yourself extra work to do, trying to move back up as you dive through the tunnel. Pop back out and around the past the Ferris wheel and line up for the final kilometre. We'll talk about that a little bit later, the technicalities of this sprint, because it is a difficult one. But then before we get to it, how dark is it in the tunnel? It, it's not. You go into the tunnel because you never see many shots in there at all. No. You see them enter and coming out. And it looks really dark, but it's lit. You can see fine in the tunnel. And so then Chavanel now takes the left-hand turn and he will go downhill and into the darkness that's not as dark as it looks from the outside. 
it's the opposite to a race handbook. Race handbook is a lot worse than it looks. The tunnel is a lot better than it looks. Gaston Viejo at the front. Do you think that when Chavanel gets across the finish line, he'll sit up? Yes. He will. So the peloton along the banks of the sand, they make the left-hand turn. They turn right, they head off to the Louvre. And when they come out of the tunnel, they'll turn sharp left and on to the Rue de Rivoli. There it is out of the tunnel. Rue de Rivoli and next to the big Ferris wheel in the Jardin de Tullier. What's the Tuileries? What's the, Excuse me. What's the population in Norway? I think it's about four and a half, five million. The amount of Norwegians on the side of the road never, ever ceases to amaze. There are always plenty of Norwegians at the Tour de France. They're genuine cycling lovers. And they're, they're great supporters for everybody too. And they, they acknowledge good performances of the rivals of their favourite riders, the Norwegian riders. They have two favourites today. Alexander Kristoff and Edvel Bosenhoek. Uh, by the way, the population is 5.2 million oh, Norway. I said 4.5 to 5. Yeah, you're way off. Do your homework first. This is Welt Poles now on the front. And back onto the Place de la Concorde. They've gone under the kilometre. And this is a super important part when you're setting up for the sprint. You see those corners, a little bit of a bottleneck and then it strings out through this section and line up for that final corner. 400 metres to go, by the time you straighten up, you've got the 350 board in front of you. As they get the welcome of the crowd in the grandstands and Sylvain Chavanel passes through the finish line for the first time on the Champs-Élysées. Little wave, he's up on the hoods. It's not a full-blooded attack by Sylvain Chavanel, but when he gets reeled in by the peloton, that's the time that the race really starts and we'll see genuine attacks. Egan Bernal with eight laps to go leads the peloton through. Nice experience for a debutante in the race. What a fantastic job he's done, the young Colombian in the high mountains. He struggled early in the Alps and that's the result of the crash that he had on the stage to Roubaix. Yeah. He went down twice. First time really heavily on his ribs when he just lost it coming into a right-hand corner. And the second one, we just saw a, a photo making impact with the back of the BMC team car. And it was reported he'd possibly broken a finger or two. He'd injured his hand. But he's come good since then. And here's a turn of pace, Stefan Kung. And this is not ceremonial. This is no uh, parade turn on the front from Stefan Kung. Not at all. Just quickly on Bernal, that stage across the cobblestones, he lost more than 16 minutes. He finishes at 27 minutes down in 15th position overall. Get rid of those 16 minutes and he's moving back up towards the top 10 in his first appearance in the race. Now the racing is... That was Lawson Craddock at the front. The man who has led the battle for the Lanton Rouge, led the race for the back end of the general classification from start to finish. Well, he's got the Lanton Rouge sewn up because he has an 18 and a half minute deficit to the rider in front of him, Jacopo Guarnieri. You don't finish last in the Tour de France. You finish the Tour de France. Well put. While there's plenty that don't. Yeah, really well put. He's back. Leader of the King of the Mountains classification, Julien Alaphilippe, change of bike. He's on his way. Nati has won on the Champs Elysees before. Ooh. The yellow helmet, the blue jersey. He's moving himself up. He's not looking after Quintana nor Landa. Looks like he might have Carte Blanche to have a go today. Former winner here. He knows how it's done. 2007, 11 years ago. Can he turn the clock back? The bell is about to sound. The breakaway has almost been caught. But there's still Niels Pollitt surviving off the front. Here he is, the 24-year-old German.
with seven kilometers remaining one lap around the famous circuit in Paris the bell sounds for the break likewise the sprinters but most importantly for the Welsh spectators so too for the yellow jersey G'day Thomas one out against the charging peloton it's just a matter of a time before he gets caught he won't hold them off but it is a great attack by Niels Pollitt saw they were going to get caught chose his moment well now the rest of the Bora Hansgrohe team to the front dueling with Trek Segafredo Julian Bernard is the man leading them Chris Froome bringing himself around on the front of Team Sky Garant Thomas just keeping it upright staying safe Pollitt he's on that concrete section right in the gutter maximizing his speed on the uphill run to the Arc de Triomphe the yellow jersey has won on the Champs Elysees in the past Bernard Hino ahead of Jok Zultamalk in 1978 you saw the graphic on the screen just a moment ago the first time the tour finished here 43 years ago back in 1975 when the winner was the Frenchman Bernard uh, Bernard Thévenet and Niels Pollard surrenders bows his head he's been caught it's still Balka Mollema at the front for Trek Segafredo instead of going head to head with Bora they've slotted in Molema doing the turn on the front the rest of the Bora team in his wheel Dimension Data on the right for Edwald Bossenhagen well, so many teams getting involved we don't normally see coming into the sprints Astana trying to set up Magnus Court Nielsen on the right Bakre Marita for Colbrelli and the first those riders in the red colors with the gold helmet on that was Palazzotti he's now slipped back slightly it's Yoni Zagir and out the front for them and even Domenico Pozzavivo coming forward supporting Sonny Colbrelli well it's a battle to be on the front up and around the Arc de Triomphe the real battle is at the bottom of the hill. They come back opposite the finish line and swing into those two corners, the right, then the left-hander, with just over two kilometres to go. Last time around the Arc de Triomphe, Peter Sagan has what's left of his team, Bora Hansgrohe, on the front, putting him in position at the front, but they're not a real lead-out team for the sprint. He'll be waiting to see which train comes past and hitch his wagon on. Five kilometres just inside, five kilometres remaining what's the risk of somebody sending their train to the front too early with the ambition to be able to win this stage and perhaps for someone like Christophe Laporte collect his first ever stage victory well timing is so important and what's left of the breeze is against the riders it's really not much but it's so easy to get caught in down this section because they're coming out of the wheels on a downhill it's like a great big washing machine and you've got to keep improving your position never think I'm at the front I'm fine keep pushing forwards because they'll keep coming out of the wheels coming up and around you get boxed in against the side it's gonna be a real race to those corners at the Place de la Concorde Peter Sagan he'll be talking to his teammates tell him move left right give me a little bit more room and then give him the yell and Oss will be driving that directing the traffic to say go now take a look over the shoulder see who's coming Sunweb on the right side of the peloton with Tom Dumoulin, Nikias Arndt a long way back a very long way back in about 40th wheel at the moment a lot of energy to spend just to get to the front they are stalking the green jersey he's on the wheel of Daniel Oss this is Maciej Bodnar now it's Marcus Burkhardt this is Yoni Izaguera this is Gorka Izaguera Carsten Christian Corrin. Christian Corrin has just done the turn of pace. Sonny Cole Brally is slipping in behind the green jersey. Astana coming forward for Magnus Court Nielsen. Here comes that moment. They're going to be opposite the finish line. It's flat now. The breeze now. It's swung a little bit at the moment. But it's this race here. FDJ Group Armour. They go now. They want to be to that corner. The right-hander of the Place de la Concorde first. They've made their run. Sagan's seen it look across. Oss also having a look. When do they go across to join? Sagan looks like he's suffering. Christoph is following Arno Demar. He's the rider in the white colours, the European champion, and Peter Sagan still looks calm and composed. Here's the right hander. All through cleanly. It was Arthur Vischo leading the charge for Group Armour FDJ, followed then by Guarneri. Next in line was Arno Demar. Perhaps that's a little too much too soon. We'll find out in a moment. UAE Emirates now at the front. 
late attack. Marco Marcado from UAE Team Emirates. They've got Alexander Kristoff. Does he think he's leading out or he's on the attack? It looks more like a last ditch attack. This is Geraint Thomas. Just a couple of kilometres to go and he's won the Tour de France. Marcado off the front. Behind, nobody willing to take it up just yet and start the lead out. <coughs> Yves Lampart, Belgian champion. He follows a Bora Hansgrohe rider on the way across. This could be the springboard for a late attack for Lampart. It's Daniel Oss going across. Oss collects his Mercado, keeps on going. Sagan's he, told him to attack. He's given him some freedom. And now four riders on the front for Group Armour FDJ. This could work out well for them with something to chase. Lampart's got to go over the top of Oss and try and attack out of the tunnel because Group Armour FDJ are going to shut it down. But Lampart has a good opportunity here. Free ride in the wheel of Daniel Oss. Is he going to come out of the tunnel? Will it be up and over the top for the Belgian? Oss still moving well. Lampart looking, checking, still getting a free ride. Group Armour FDJ for Damar. Sagon in his wheel. Olivia Legac doing the chasing at the front. Here goes Lampard. He's leaving Oss. The gap opening up. The Belgian champion's chosen his moment well. Group Armour FDJ. They're seeing a big gap. He's won races like this before. He'll be very hard to peg back. Kilometre to go. Underneath the kites. It's a handy lead for Lampard. The Belgium national champion on the road. He was last year in the individual time trial, and the gap is working to his favour. The gap is opening up. They are not catching him. He's extended. He's now holding. It's over to the next man in the line. Yves Lampard is about to go into the Place Le Concorde. This is going to be extremely close. The peloton accelerating now. The gap still 100 metres for the Belgian champion. He's about to make the right-hand turn. He'll see the finish line. He looks across his shoulder, and he won't like what he sees then because it's now Trek Segafredo coming to the front. They're charging into position. It's Sturven chasing Eve Lampart. His legs are tiring up. Jasper Sturven leading. Degen Kolb now charging. Christoph comes through. Demar wants a piece of the action. It's Christoph. Degen Kolb. Christoph. It's the Norwegian. The Viking is charging. It is Christoph. He gets there. Four years on from his last win. Alexander Christoph. The European champion is the champion of the Champs-Élysées. And the overall race winner, Geraint Thomas, with Froome all smiles alongside him. What a brilliant finish. The attack by Lampard was perfect, followed Oss. They mowed him down. It was Degen Cobb who went early, Laporte on the right. Arnold Demar chose to go up the middle, not follow follow Christoph. Christoph hanging in, and this time he doesn't die inside of the line. He holds them off by a length. It's been a long time between Tour de France wins for the Norwegian, but he has taken arguably the biggest of wins that a sprinter can possibly take. How much is jubilation? How much is relief? It's been a long time coming. This will be so emotional for Alexander Kristoff. He's finally got one. He's the current European champion. He's won two stages in the Tour before. That's three or four years ago. He's back. He persevered. He survived. He followed Degen Kolb and they went head to head. Three across the road and Alexander Kristoff not looking at anybody else head down quick peek up where do i make my throw and he knew he hung on he had it by a length eve lampart shaking her head it was a really good try by the belgian champion boss and hagen on the left with laporte but they're out of it demar he had a good run at it came out of the wheel of degen Kolb, just didn't quite have the acceleration christoph wins it looked like degen Kolb hung on for second with arnold demar in third and further back down the road, riders sitting up. Ferrari, he knows that Christoph has won. And Geraint Thomas, alongside Chris Froome, wins his first Tour de France. Degen Kolb in second, Demar in third.
Bosenhagen in fourth, Christoph Laporte or Ricchesi in fifth. It'll be close between those two. But for them, it doesn't matter. They doesn't wanted matter. to win. This is what it's all about. And this, of course. Not sure who's more excited at the moment, the Welsh watching this or the Norwegian commentators next door with Alexander Kristoff winning the stage. Lucky today was the last day because I think they just broke the desk in their commentary booth because they are jumping up and down. They've gone bananas. Dan Martin with Alexander Kristoff. Two stage wins for UAE Team Emirates. As the contrast between the style of the stage win and the type of rider, the size difference between them. That was a super win. Long time coming. Four years since his last stage victory. And he gets it ahead of Degen Cole with DeMar in third. And Sagan, nowhere to be seen. Those injuries, even worse than what he's letting on. Well, the fact we saw Daniel Os go on the attack, Sagan, he tried. He tried until the, the moment where it's really got to happen. And he knew, and we knew, watching him the last few days, he's been in agony trying to ride. Completely contorted on the bike. And he just had to be realistic in the end. He's won the green jersey for a record equaling sixth time. I'm still buzzing from that win. It's a fantastic sprint to watch. Tactically, Christoph was absolutely perfect. He got on the best train, which was that of Trek Sigafredo, Jasper Sturven for John Degenkolb. And Degenkolb, he held strong for so long. Just in that final 50 metres, Christoph edged out by a, a bike length. Here it is, through the corner. Degenkolb second, Christoph third, Demar fourth. The pace winds up. Jasper Sturven out to the middle of the road, gives room, and Degenkolb goes really quite early, and so does Christoph. Arnold DeMar stays in the slipstream of Degen Kolb, then moves out, but just not coming with that zip. And the pure horsepower, the grunt of the big Norwegian, and especially across of what an the cobbles, really to suits him. Uh, your Tour de France, you've won on the Champs Elysees. Yeah, that's a dream coming true. Uh, I dreamt about this victory for many years, and uh, I was close many times before, but I didn't really manage to beat the faster guys like Greipel, Kittel, Cavendish. So. Today they are not here, they are out after the mountains and yeah, today I was the fastest so I'm super happy. Yeah, and you're still here and that, that uh, last count was amazing, take us through the, those final moments. Yeah, I was a bit far back after the runabout, but I was, uh, not after the tunnel, but I was with the uh, Ferrari and uh, then the trek you did a really good leader from behind and I managed to get the John's wheel and I could start uh, at a really good spot and I managed to pass John and it was still far out but uh, um, I saw nobody manage to come closer, so I was, yeah, last 20 meters sure I'm going to win, and I'm so happy that I managed to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you.